Hi, in this video, we're going to write some computer code to demonstrate how blockchain works. So in a previous video, I showed you some of the theory. Now we're going to actually do some computer code so we can see specifically what we're talking about. In the next few minutes, we're going to create a program that will demonstrate a chain of blocks, some transactions. Then we're going to hash each of those, and I will show you what happens if somebody tries to commit some fraud, and we will quickly identify it with our blockchain. So here's what the final result will look like. It's not a pretty program, it's in text, it's not a very graphical thing, but you'll be able to see a blockchain and the values that go with it. So I'm going to start programming here. I'm using Eclipse and Java, so this is a pretty typical language. So I'm going to call mine blockchain example and click finish. All right, so I've got a project here. Now let's go ahead and start adding some things to it. So I'm going to create a new class. So I'll right click and choose new, and I'm going to call this blockchain program. So this is the main program, so we better check the box that says make a public main statement and click finish. All right, so here's our code. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is demonstrate just what a hashing function can do. So let's create a string. I'll just call it statement one, and um, let's come up with a phrase. It can be anything. I'll just say, my world is perfect. Now, the next line down is going to be an integer value of a result called hash code. So int hash value equals statement one dot hash code. So this function here is built into Java and will give us a number. So now let's put some output to our program. Let's just do a print line that says our statement equals statement one, whose hash value is, and then we'll print out the hash value. So I'm going to make one little spelling correction there, and let's go ahead and run the program. So you can see that my statement here is my world is perfect, and then it says whose hash value is. Now this number here is a seemingly random number. Every time I run the program, though, I will get the exact same number because that's how the hash function works. Now, what would happen if I change this just slightly? If I said, my world is nearly perfect, and now let's run it again. So remember, our number here starts at 502. Let's see what happens the second time we run it. So now you can see it's completely different. We actually went negative, so negative 182 and change. So this could go back if I remove the uh, nearly part and let's go back to beginning and we go back to 502. So it seems like if you want to detect a change in a document, a hash function is perfect. Let's make one very minor change. Let's just add a period at the end. Will that just change one number here or will it completely change it again? Well, you're probably right. It'll change it completely. So let's run it and now we're back to a negative number. That's a different negative number than we had before. So now let's move on to a different example of hashing. I'm going to hash an array. So let's create an array of names. I'll just call it list1, and it's a list of strings. So we're going to have Alex, Becky, and Cyril. And let's make an identical copy to that, and let's call it list2. So now the next goal is to see if we can hash these arrays. So the idea is we're going to do a new function, arrays.hashcode, and then inside of there you put list one. So it's just a little different syntax, but it's doing the same kind of math. Now I'm going to create hash one and hash two based on these two lists. So these two lists hopefully are identical because I've spelled every name the same. Then finally we want to do the print line to show the results. Let's see what happens here when we run the program. Okay, so the results are in. Hash one shows it looks like it might be the same as hash two. So we can verify that a list of things is equal. So that's going to sound a lot like our hashing of a string of blocks. So that's where we're going with this. So now let's just change Cyril's name from a lowercase c to an uppercase c and check the results. And not surprisingly, they should be different. So this one starts as 158 and the second one starts as 155. Now they look kind of similar, but that's just a, just coincidence. They could have been a completely negative and positive number. You never know what you're going to get with a hash. All right, so now it's going to be the demonstrate a series of blocks in a chain. So in this, we're going to have to create a new class and then assign some values to it. So let's make a new class. I'm going to call it block. So we'll do a right click in the source area, choose new class and name it block. 
So to create this, we're going to have to have three different properties. In a block, we are going to have a list of transactions. So we'll make those just strings for this example. So in real life, a transaction might be more complex. Then we're going to have a value for hashing. And this will be an integer, so we'll just call it block hash. So that's the hash for this block. And then, as the chain goes, we are going to have a hash of the previous block as well, included in the calculation. So when we're done, we're going to have three different properties. We'll have transactions, a block hash, and a previous block hash. Now in Java code, we need to have getters and setters. So you can generate these quickly with a right-click source and choose generate getters and setters, and we'll select all properties. Next, we're going to make a constructor. So in the constructor, we're going to also generate it automatically. So we'll right-click, choose source, and generate a constructor using fields. Now, I only need the constructor to have two properties that are external. So let's check the transactions and the previous block. So we'll leave out the block hash for right now. So when we're done, we have a constructor that has the two different properties as parameters, and then we assign those parameters inside of the constructor. So that's a normal Java constructor. Now, inside of this constructor, we're going to create a new formula for the block hash. So this dot block hash is going to be equal to a calculation that we'll do right now. So what I want to do for this uh, hash is to combine two different things. I want the previous block hash as well as a hash of the current transactions. So the second item in the list is fairly easy. We're just going to take the previous block hash and that's going to be the item in the list. Now the first item in the array is going to be a item which is a hash value of all of the transactions in this block. So this here is the computation for how to do a block hash. So we have an array of two integers and the first integer is a hash from the array of transactions. So a little bit of nesting going on here. So hang on, this will look simple once you start to see how it works and you'll understand how this, this is going to code out. Lastly, for this class, we need to have a toString method because we're going to be printing what a block is. So we'll let it generate the toString method with the source and generate command again. When we're done here, we will have an ability to print out all of the properties of this block. All right, so let's save this and let's switch back into our blockchain program. So our blockchain is going to be an array list. So let's create an array list of type block. So this list will have blocks in it. And let's call it blockchain. So we will initialize it as an empty array. Also, you can see that we have to do the proper import to make array list work. So now we're going to start building our first block in the chain. So I need to have a string or an array of strings. We'll call it initial values. And I'm just going to make two statements here. You can make two, you can make 50, it doesn't really matter but this is the initial values of who has what money in my world. So I have, 500, I have $700 and Miguel has 550. So now I want to create my first block in the chain. So I will define this block and call it first block. And we will do an initialization. So I need to match the constructor here with first block. So when I look at the constructor properties that I need to do, is I need to add arguments to match the uh, pattern of the constructor. So it says use a string, array of strings, and an integer. So let's go ahead and add those as they suggest. And they say, I guessed, but you wanted to use initial values. Is that correct? And that is correct. Now, hash two is not what I wanted to do. I'm just gonna make up some number. So you can put in any number you want. I'm gonna use zero because that's a good starting place for anything. So that's my previous block hash. And of course, there was no previous block, so we'll just make up the number. Finally, let's add the first block to the blockchain. So we have um, an add statement. So in three statements, we have created the initial block. We have added it to the blockchain. Now I want to see what I've done with my code, so let's do some print statements. So the first print statement will say the first block is, and so the, uh, the, the block uh, code actually has a two string method in it, so that's where this is going to come into play. After I have the first block printed, Let's go ahead and change the uh, statement to so show the full block, so we'll, the blockchain. So we'll show the entire chain. Okay, so what does this look like? Let's run it and see what the results come up with. 
All right, let's look down here and we can ignore the first two statements. That's from the previous section. And now we have a new item. So you can see the details here on this line. It says the first block is, and then we have the, uh, the two string method coming into play. So the block contains an array called transactions. The first transaction shows my numbers and then it shows Miguel numbers. And then there's the block hash. So that's the unique number for this hash. And then the previous block as well. So now when it says the second statement, it says the blockchain is, it's pretty much the same results, but now it's going to uh, just show the entire chain. So there's an extra little bracket around the edge. So that's the first block. Now, what we're going to make now is the second block. So for the second block, I'm going to name it something different. I could call it second block, but I'm going to name it as Shad gives it away. And you can see that Shad gives Tim $40, Shad gives Tanya uh, $60 and gives Terry $100. So these are just strings and we can interpret those any way we want. So in a court of law, we can argue about who has what money based on what it says in English. But in the computer world, these are just strings of letters. So for the next line down, we need to change the block name. So instead of uh, first block, let's call it second block. So the second block in the chain is going to have a new constructor as well. So we want to provide it the transactions. And the transactions here were called Shad gives it away. Now the second number in the constructor is zero. So we don't want zero to come up here. We want the actual block from the first guy to be the value here in the, in the input. So to get that value, we can use the getters and setters in the, in the class. So let's type in first block dot get the block hash. And so that should give us the inputs that we need to create the second block. The next two lines, let's just change the word first block to second block. So we will add the second block to the chain. And then when we print the message, we will say the second block is, and then we'll do a two string method there. So now we should see two different transactions and we should see that the, the numbers of the block hash are the same for block one and different for block two. So we run the program and this time we have more results. So we can see that the numbers here should have been the same. So the hash does not change for block one. However, block two comes along and it says we have new transactions. So we're looking at three different things in the list and it gives us a hash to verify that those are the values that we should use. The previous block statement comes along and now we have a new blockchain. So that the key learnings now are that the block hash for blockchain number two or item two in the blockchain this depends on the previous block's hash value. So if something changes in block one, this number here will also change. So let's make a new block. Let's call it block three. We'll copy and paste from two. Now I'm going to name the new string or the new transactions as Shad gets some back. So inside of the uh, array, let's create two different strings. Let's call one Tim gives Shad $10 and the second one is Terry gives $50 to Shad. So like I said, these really don't matter to the computer. They're just strings of letters and the humans can interpret what they mean. So now let's go through the rest of the code, changing second block into third. So the third block is going to be built with uh, Shad gets some back as its transactions. And then the previous block is the parameter that has to come in next. So we want the previous block, which is uh, block two, second block, get the hash. Then we're going to add the third block to the blockchain and then print it out. So we'll say third block is and then we'll print off the toString method for the third block. Now the block chain should be able to print normally just like we did before, so no changes to the last line. All right, it's time to run it again, and now we should have three different transactions. Okay, so we got the results here. We, the uh, block one should not change at all. We still have the same block hashes. Uh, block number two, we should see a new hash here, a new value, and then the third one, has its own hash, which this time turns out to be a negative number. Now I'm going to make a note of these and copy them into comments in the code so we can compare them if they change. So I'm going to copy from the output and put the block hash values back into the code as comments. So if we don't change anything, these hash values should remain the same. So block hash number one, block hash two, and then the third block hash. So you notice the third one's a negative number. That's just completely random. You never know what the hash will get. So that doesn't have anything to do with the actual value of the money. Now here is the value of blockchain. 
So everyone agrees that this is the results, that uh, if we calculated it up, I started with 700, gave some away, got a little back. Uh, what do I have? Maybe 500 left or something? It's just an estimate. But what happens if we cheat? So somewhere along the line, let's say uh, Tim comes in and says, I'm going to modify the code. So instead of $40, I'm going to change it to $400. And now let's save and run the program. So now we look at the uh, original value that we had, where block hash number one was 1645, etc. And I look down in the results that I got this time, it says 1645. So block one remains intact, no changes. Let's see what the hash for number two was. This was 6307. And now when we come down to the second block, we come along and it says here the block now changed to 8230. And so obviously somebody did a change to our transactions. Nothing else changed, but the hash value indicates there's a difference. So that would raise a flag to say something went wrong. Well, what happens if we just carried on with business and the third block didn't change at all? These still have the same values as the original time we ran. What happened to its hash? So uh, negative uh, 502 is what it was. And now we look down at the results and it says the block hash is a negative 309. And so the fact that the third chain or third item in the chain has a new hash tells us that there was fraud either in this block or in some previous block. And so this is the demonstration to show if one element in the link of the chains breaks, then the whole chain breaks. So this simple code demonstration just shows three links in a chain. But we can see that if we break the middle link, then the middle break it is going to affect the third item in the chain as well. And so that is the idea of blockchain, is that if everyone has a copy of these hashes, and if you get an update to the strings, you should be able to verify with certainty that the original values remain intact. If somebody tries to change something, the hash values change as well. And if we saw in the previous video about how blockchain works, you can see that if a majority of the people agree on a list of hashes, that becomes the accepted value. And so fraud is very difficult to perform if you have these hashes intact. And so that gives you an idea of how blockchain works, looking at it through computer code. Now, obviously, in the real world, we're not just going to have strings for blockchains. We're going to have more complex things. We're going to have entire transactions. We're going to have complex object types. But if you put a hash on it, you're still going to get a number. And that number can be verified whether the object has been tampered with or not. So check out some of the other videos. If you missed the first one on how blockchain works, that'll tell you some of the high-level concepts of that are, what are here. Also, the idea of how Bitcoin works, I'm going to show in another video here that's going to talk about encryption and RSA and how you can actually make a mathematical formula turn into currency. So that's coming up in a future video as well.